Okay, so here's part two of the uh, uh, recap of the uh, history of the English language lecture uh, that I gave in class. And I wanted to pick up where we left off last time, which is where we ended up with modern English. Modern English, believe it or not, is something that is Shakespearean and beyond. So that's like the 1600s uh, and later, uh, 1500s even and later. Um, but what we what I alluded to last time was that um, the British Empire necessitated a standardized version version of the language. In other words, see that map right there? That's the British Empire at its height in the 1700s. It had to have a standard version or we wouldn't be able to use English. People in Australia or South Africa or Canada or India would not, after a while, be able to communicate with each other. Remember what happened with Proto-Indo-European? It ended up being a lot of different languages and now everybody speaks a different kind of language and it's hard to understand each other. So the British saw that coming. They decided to standardize the language. It wasn't something the government did. It's what schools and universities did. They started coming out with standardized um, uh, dictionaries with standardized spelling and then standardized rules. Now, some of the rules were kooky and nutty, like no double negatives or completely outlawing ain't, even though ain't is a completely legitimate and grammatically correct contraction for I am not or I have not. Uh, but now the rules, even if they're kind of kooky, are are there. They're in place, okay? Um, so chalk it up to the crazy English teachers back in the 1700s and 1600s, if you will. But that's what standardized English comes from, and we call it standardized English usage, S-E-U, right? Um, so next we talked a little bit about how, the, how there are many different American Englishes, which are kind of cool. Um, in the United States, we developed uh, our own dictionary of the English language. Hey, we had a revolution. We kicked the Brits out. We decided we we're going to, the British may have invented the language, but it takes Americans to perfect it, right? So Webster comes out with the new American dictionary. And that's why some of the words that we use in, in American English are, are spelled differently or pronounced differently or used differently than the British, right? We spell color C-O-L-O-R. They spell it C O L. O U R, okay, and so we say theater, they say theater, some of us say theater, um, but we spell it differently, or center, or things word like this, or we might use a word like elevator, and they use the word lift, we use bathroom, they use loo or lavatory, um, but we talked about the fact that that, that there are very, diff very different dialects throughout the country, and this sometimes has a lot to do, not just with ethnicity, but with the origin of the English speakers who originally settled there. Now, you might be Polish or German or something like that, living in, in Georgia, but um, because the original settlers came there and spoke with a with a kind of a rounded vowel southeastern English accent, um, that was terrible. But um, you inherited their accent in a way, even though ethnically you weren't from that area. Okay, um, even our terminology is regional, using words like soda versus pop, um, water cooler versus water fountain, and even up in the upper Midwest they use the word bubbler. So the the bottom line is that we all have a home English. That's the version of English that we speak at home, that our family uh, uses, that we grew up speaking, and that's all perfectly well and good and okay, and it's part of our identity. There's nothing wrong with it. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Everybody has one. If you're a native English speaker, if you're not, if you don't, you have a a, a home. Speaker. Spanish or a home Portuguese or a home French, right? But there's a standardized version of the language that is used in school, in business, in government, in international um, uh, dealings. And that standardized fixed version of the language exists for a reason, so that people in one country speaking English can understand people in another country speaking English, okay? Now, the standardization is not exact, and it's got a lot of flaws to it, but basically it's designed to perpetuate understanding and commerce and diplomacy and all of those kinds of things. So it's used in those kinds of settings, okay? Um, now, we also talked a little bit about grammar versus usage. Most people have no problem with grammar. If you're a native English speaker, you grow Grow up knowing how to use grammar. I mean, it's kind of silly. By the age four, you know what grammar is. Grammar is basically three things. Syntax, which is word order. Morphology, which is how words change. Swim, swam, swum, right? Have, had, has, right? How they change, like the declensions of verbs and things of this nature. And then phonology, the kinds of sounds we make with our mouth and with our vocal cords and those kinds of things. Um, so all grammar is made up of is three things like that, okay? If it ain't one of those, ooh, he said something that was not grammatical. If it isn't one of those, if it ain't one of those, then it's usage, okay? So grammar is how the language is structured, 
how it's put together mechanically, what you can and can't do with it, right? Think about the parts of an engine. Usage is how you drive the thing, how it's used in polite society, right? Can you eat your dinner with a shrimp fork? Yeah, it's kind of difficult, but you can do it. Should you eat your dinner, a steak, a lobster, with a shrimp fork? No. Can you wear your napkin tucked into your your uh, your shirt collar? You can, but you, you look like a hillbilly and a hick. Okay, so one is about what you can or can't do with the language, what it, how it operates, what, you know, the word order, the changes. You can't say things I, like, I loaf of store went to bread get. You can't say that. That doesn't make any sense. That violates syntax. And you can't say he swum he, he swum down the river. No, you can't you can't say that. Okay, he he swimmed down the river. You can't you can't say you can say that. So you, you, there are certain things that you can't do with the language, right? Um, and so, but then there are things that you shouldn't do because people will get confused or they'll think that you're not educated or you're not using stand the standard version we use, right? It's just real different. Native speakers acquire ninety five percent of grammar by age six. I mean, you pretty much know grammar. So we're not really studying grammar for the most part. We kind of are because we need to know what the parts of speech are. But for the most part, when you're studying language so that you can become a better writer and speaker, what you're really studying most of the time is usage. And that is how do educated people tend to use the language, okay? So, um, and we have to study it because it differs from our home English, um, sometimes greatly, sometimes not so greatly. And remember, one of the things that we talked about is the fact that dictionaries, to reflect that, that ch the changes over time, are descriptive in English, not prescriptive. In other words, they describe how people are using words, how they're pronouncing words, how they're, 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 uh, they're uh, spelling those words, not how they have to. OK, that would be to prescribe like your doctor prescribes it. He says, go take this. Right. They describe like what are people doing? Are the people using this word differently than they did 10 years ago? Are they pronouncing it differently? Are they spelling it differently? So they're very descriptive. They're not prescriptive. The dictionary, you don't go to a dictionary and say, see there, it says that you have to spell it that way because the dictionary is never claim in English. Dictionaries never claim to be the authority of how you must spell something. They simply describe how people currently are spelling it. Now, not everybody, not idiots, okay? Only educated people in professional settings. How are they using the word, okay? So we're descriptive, not prescriptive. And that allows the language to sort of breathe and grow over time, to add new words, to change, right? It doesn't straight jacket the, the language. So that's the difference between grammar and usage, prescriptive, descriptive, and those are the kinds of things that we want to focus on for, for this material. Okay, um, so if I can get this thing to stop, I'll stop it. But if it doesn't want to stop, then it won't stop. Um, so that's a little recap for uh, the second part of our history of English language. We went through all this history for a reason, and that is to tell you how did we get to where we are and why do we study English grammar, but mostly usage. Okay, and why do we have some things that we do and sometimes we don't do, and why didn't that make sense, and why does this guy say ain't and this guy say says isn't? There, there are reasons for it. Okay, so an educated person needs to know how to use the language in a professional setting, and that's what we're studying in here. Okay, very good. Thank you.